the seat, please. When I think about the crucifixion, I just think about God's overwhelming love for us. Now, as I was thinking about this, holding Emily, I was just thinking about how God loved us so much that he would let his son come to earth and take our place and suffer and die on the cross to pay for our sins so that we could have a relationship with him. And when I think about that, I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude and just feel his amazing love. When I think about the crucifixion of Christ, I think about just the incredible amount of grace and generosity that that act displays from God, and especially for someone who's undeserving of that kind of grace. And thinking on it and reflecting on just what that event means, it causes me to do an inventory of my life and ask if I'm living in a manner worthy of the crucifixion, if I'm living in a way that honors his sacrifice for my behalf, that honors his grace and generosity in my life because I want to live in a way that doesn't take that act lightly because of the immense love and grace that it brings. And that's what the, the crucifixion uh, reminds me of. When I think about the crucifixion, I think about it from a mom's perspective. And I can't even imagine allowing any one of my children to die for someone else's bad choices or something that someone else has done, or as we call it, a sin and I can't even imagine that God was able to send a son to be tortured and die for something that I've done wrong, and that's a greater love than I could ever imagine. The crucifixion means to me unconditional love. Jesus died on the cross because he saved us and he will raise on Easter. The crucifixion of Jesus what we're talking about this morning the crucifixion of Jesus what does it mean to you the crucifixion of Jesus we know this morning as we're going to discuss proclaims God's love see the crucifixion is the one event in all of history of man that has changed and transformed our culture the crucifixion is when light invaded the darkness the crucifixion of Jesus is when hope began to spread across the globe. It's the one event that has changed the course of history. It changes the destiny and the future of us, a future of mankind. The crucifixion is God proclaiming his love for all humans everywhere. He is speaking into the past. He's whispering into the present. And he's shouting to us in the future, I love you. That's what the cross was. That's what God, what, that, what God communicated to us from the cross is that his love for us is overwhelming. That his love for us is more and stronger than his anger of sin. That God loves us unconditionally and completely. That's what Christ communicates to us from the cross. I want you to think about the crucifixion in the context of John 3, 16, maybe in a way that you've not yet thought of it before. Most of us are familiar with uh, John 3, 16. If you're not, I'm sure as soon as I begin to say it, you're going to go, oh yeah, I've, I've heard that one before. John 3, 16, Jesus was speaking, and he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Have you ever taken out the words, the world? And have you ever taken out the word everyone and replaced them with your personal name? For instance, if I was to read that back, I would read it, for God loved the world so much, or for God loved Joe so much that he gave his one and only son, so that if Joe believes in him, he won't perish, but have eternal life. Have you ever stuck your name in there? Have you ever said, for God so loved Alex so much? For God so loved Dave so much? For God so loved Betty so much that he gave his one and only son, and that if I trust in him, I will not perish, but have everlasting life? See, God loves you unconditionally and completely and totally.
The cross declares it. You may doubt it. You may say, I've never experienced God's love before. I, I don't really think that God loves me. I don't, you know, if you knew what I did or if you knew the things that have happened to me. If, you know, I, I hear from people all the time who have experienced abuse in their past. And they say something like that all the time. And they relate to me because I've, I've walked that path of being abused as a kid. And if God really loved me, why did he let this abuse happen to me? And I, and I always love being able to point them to Romans 5.8. It says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, there's nothing more that Christ has to do to prove that he loves us. There's nothing more that God can point to in all of history that proves and demonstrates that his love for us as human beings is real. It's physical. It's life-changing. That even while I was at my worst, Christ was dying on the cross for me. Even when I was at my worst in my sin, Christ was dying on the cross for me. Many of us in this room would not die for even a good man or a noble man. But Jesus was willing to die for a sinful man, for a cruel man, for a hateful man. Jesus is willing to die for the murderer and for the adulterer and for the liar and for the thief. While we were at our worst Christ was at his best. Suffering on the cross for you and I, demonstrating his overwhelming love. That's what the cross proclaims. That's what the cross communicates. My prayer is this morning as we worship and we talk more about the cross, is that you would experience the full love of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you for loving us. Thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. Thank you that you sent your son to take away the sin of the world because you love us, because you have compassion on us, because you show us mercy and grace. So Lord, would you please allow us to experience your love for us today in a meaningful way, that life-changing, transforming everlasting, eternal love of God. May we experience that today as we reflect on the crucifixion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I think of the crucifixion, my emotions run both ends of the spectrum. Uh, On the one hand, as a mother, I agonize over the fact that um, our Heavenly Father had to make the choice to offer His only Son as a sacrifice for me. And that breaks my heart on so many levels. But on the other end of the spectrum, I'm filled with such gratitude and happiness and peace knowing that It was because of that sacrifice that I have a chance to uh, live forever and be at the feet of Jesus when my time comes. So the crucifixion just, it's the ultimate gift. The crucifixion means to me is forgiveness. I've made so many wrong mistakes in my life that I don't even deserve life at all. But Jesus died on the cross to tell me that, hey, it's going to be okay and I forgive you and that He's never going to let me go. To me, the crucifixion was the greatest gift God gave me. To me, that helps me to love fearlessly and to live fearlessly. Because to me, the crucifixion means that God loved me enough to die on the cross so that I can live forever with Him and I can live a life with purpose and meaning and without fear. The cross reminds me that Jesus died for my sins. Not only does Jesus, does the crucifixion of Jesus proclaim God's love for us, but the crucifixion of Jesus also points out and demonstrates forgiveness. It's through the cross that we are forgiven for our sin. I want you to think about the life of Jesus. If you've ever read the Gospels, you would know and understand that Jesus was He's, of course, the Son of God, but He was a good man. 
that he loved the unlovable, that he spent time talking with the outcasts of society, those who were lonely, those who were rejected, those who were hurting, those who had lost a loved one, Jesus spent time with them. He spent time with the drunks and he spent time with the prostitutes. He spent time with the, the tax collectors and the chief of sinners. He spent time with the scum of society that everybody else wanted to uh, ostracize, that nobody else wanted to be around. And Jesus spoke to them and said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me, all of you who are burdened, and let me give you rest. Jesus was a good, caring man. Three years of his life he spent demonstrating love to his people, his creation. Nobody could find any fault in what he said. Nobody could find fault with what he did. And for over three years he spent that time until one day the Roman soldiers grabbed him, beat him, took a crown of thorns and shoved it on his head took the cat of nine tails and scourged his back, beating him over and over again, ripping off chunks of his flesh, crushing his bone. Why murder a good man? Why murder a man who did nothing but demonstrate love? Why murder a good man who cared about the people that nobody else cared about? Why murder a man who worked miracles and gave sight to the blind and made the lame walk? Why did they murder such a man? The reality is, we murdered him. You and I did that. Romans 6.23 spells out very clearly what the cross was all about. Romans 6 23 as Paul was writing he said the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ in that verse we see a picture of what the cross did and who put Jesus on the cross see Romans 3 uh, Romans 6 23 says clearly that the wages of sin is death well who is it who 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 earned that wage did Jesus earn that wage of sin? No, we're told in Romans 3, 23 that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we are the one that earned the wage of sin, which was death. We earned death. And it was a penalty that none of us could face. It was a penalty that none of us could carry on our own, that we could not shoulder the weight of sin on our own, that God's wrath over sin was poured out on his son, Jesus. John the Baptist said about Jesus, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What happened on the cross and why Jesus was murdered was because we are sinners. We put him there, and he paid the penalty for us. And then we see the other half of Romans 6.23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Here's what happened on the cross. That our penalty of sin, the wage of death that we deserve, Jesus said, I take the penalty. And when he received the fullness of God's wrath being poured out on him, what he did was he gave us his righteousness. He took away our sin and he gave, up, gave us his righteousness. He gave us his perfection. He gave us his holiness. He gave us his purity. He took away our sin. He took away our sinful nature. He took away our, what we deserved and he imparted to us his righteousness. That's why when God looks at Joe Donahue right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the worst and 10 being the righteousness of Christ, God looks at Joe Donahue and he sees a, a 10. Not because of what I did, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. He gave me forgiveness. And in 1991, as a teenager, 18 years old, I knelt down and I asked Jesus to save me and I thanked him for what he did for me on the cross. I thanked him for forgiveness. And in that moment, 
As Paul said, I became crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. He took away our sin. He took away our shame. He took away the punishment that we deserve. And he gave us his goodness. He gave us his righteousness. He gave us his holiness. That's called forgiveness. Jesus was very clear as he gathered with his disciples and he had that communion supper with him. He was very clear with them on what the cross was going to be all about. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, Luke writes and says this, He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Did you catch it? That the the crucifixion was for you? That what Christ did was for you? That's what we deserve? That's what we had earned? And his body was broken for you and I? His blood was poured out for you and I? That's forgiveness. In a moment, we're going to celebrate together as a body of believers through communion. We're going to celebrate and acknowledge that in the crucifixion, Jesus offers us forgiveness. And if you're a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you. We welcome you to join us in this time of communion and celebration and reflection on what Jesus did for us on that cross. But if you're not yet a follower of Jesus... I want to encourage you. Do you know you can become a follower of Jesus just like that? That you can come become a follower of Jesus right now in this room, in this place? I want to help you understand really this picture of forgiveness. And I want to make sure you understand that, that God is not waiting for you to mess up again. That God's not hanging this bag of sin, everything that you've ever done in your life, over your head and saying, well, I'm just waiting for you to mess up one more time. I want you to imagine, if you would, that you were a a teenager growing up in the 90s and the aughts, I guess is what we call the 2000s. But you're a teenager. And one day you walk home, (coughs) excuse me, one day you walk home and you open up the living room door and your mom and dad are sitting around the computer and they're watching the YouTube. And on the YouTube is a video of every sin you've ever committed in your life. Every time you broke God's command, every time you sinned, whether you thought it was in secret and nobody else saw, or whether it was a public sin that everybody saw, every sin you've ever committed, anything you've ever done wrong, your mom and your dad are watching the video, and it's a long video. And your dad sees you and says, hey, son, come on over here. Daughter, come on over here. I want you to watch this with us. And you sit back and you watch in shame as your mom and your dad see everything that you ever did that was wrong, a whole list of it. And they finish the video, and dad gets up, and he turns to you, and he puts his hand on your shoulders, and he looks you deep in the eyes with love. He says, son, I know that you regret what you've done. I know you feel shame. Your mom and I, we've seen everything that you've ever done now. We've seen it all. There's nothing about your life that's hidden from us. We've seen everything. We want you to know that we love you. We forgive you. Here are the keys. Be back by 11. (laughs) See, that's what forgiveness is. That's what forgiveness is. If we're we're serious about having our lives changed by Jesus, if we're serious about understanding what forgiveness is, that is forgiveness. God does not hold your sin over your head any longer. He says it's done. It's dealt with. All the wrath of God that he had towards sin was poured out on Jesus. That means everything you've ever done wrong, Jesus paid the penalty for already. Every sin that you're ever going to commit, Jesus has already paid the penalty for that sin. He has forgiven you completely. Before we receive communion, I want you to have an opportunity to experience that kind of forgiveness. I want you to have an opportunity to become a Christ follower. Paul writes in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth 
that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, there's two steps in there. In order for you to become a follower of Jesus, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you know what that is? That's just saying, Jesus, you're my boss from now on. You can whisper it. You can shout it out loud. But Jesus, you're my boss. And you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. You know what Paul is saying there? That Jesus wasn't just some guy who died. That Jesus was the living God who died, paid the penalty for your sin, and rose from the dead, and one day is going to return. That's what Paul's saying. Do you believe that? Right? Do you, that's what it takes to believe, to become a follower of Jesus. So before we receive the communion, before we receive the elements, I want you, if you are not yet a follower of Jesus, to have a few moments of silence so that you can say to God, I admit that I'm a sinner and I accept Jesus as a Lord of my life. I believe what you did on the cross. I believe that you've forgiven me. I believe that you died and I believe that you're going to return. You believe that in your heart. You say that in your ma- with your mouth, with your lips, and you will be saved. A Christ follower. So let's take a moment for you to make that decision. When I think of the cross, um, the words that come to mind are life, sacrifice, forgiveness, hope and freedom, freedom from my past, freedom from the man I used to be. When I look at the cross, I'm reminded that I am a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. When I think about the crucifixion and and what Jesus did for all of us, it's really hard sometimes to even fathom what he did but his immense love for us and his sacrifice that he gave was so incredibly uh, amazing for all of us. It just really makes me think about the eternal picture and getting to be with Jesus eternally. I'm so grateful for that and for his forgiveness. Yeah, and um, when I think of the crucifixion, um, I just know that hope is on the horizon um, because of the resurrection is to come. And that's what the crucifixion means to me. To me, the crucifixion means that I am set free from my chains of perfectionism and anxiety, and I don't have to live a life of those expectations, but instead I can live joyfully and unashamedly in Christ. Jesus washed me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, with the one to help me one. He'll be strong. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> it's always hard to follow that. The crucifixion of Jesus not only points to love, not only provides forgiveness, but the crucifixion of Jesus now gives his followers hope. Hope. When we walk through difficult valleys, difficult situations in life, when we get that diagnosis, when we get our, uh, when we get the pink slip, when we're let go, when we walk through some type of financial disaster, followers of Jesus continue to have hope because of the resurrection. It's because of that death and resurrection that we as followers of Jesus do not have to fear death or what comes next. We are able to live faithfully and we are able to live courageously because of the cross. We have been set free. We are changed. Not we were changed. We are in the present state changed, transformed by Jesus. We do not live our lives as those who have no hope. Christ Death and resurrection proves that. We have hope. Paul wrote in Romans 8, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? 
because we tend to point to those things and say, well, maybe Christ doesn't, know, doesn't love us any longer. Maybe the, maybe the sinful part of our lives will creep into our hearts and cause us to doubt. And Paul goes on to write, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above, no power in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That means as followers of Jesus, while we might struggle with depression for a season, our hope is in what happened to us at the cross. Our hope has been, has been amplified because of what Jesus has done. We know that Jesus is able to change anyone. We know our lives have been transformed because of what Christ has done, and we live with hope. We're not going to live in fear of death. We're going to live forever. We're not going to fear in life because Christ has given us victory, and he holds the keys of life and death in his hands. Our hope is in him. So what does that crucifixion mean to you? I'll tell you what it means to me. The crucifixion points to and proclaims Jesus' love for me. The crucifixion provides forgiveness for me. And the crucifixion gives me hope. My prayer is that as followers of Jesus, we would be living in that hope in Christ daily let's pray together god thank you for the hope the overwhelming victory that is in us because of what christ has done thank you father that you have defeated death you have defeated sin that sin can no longer reign on this earth unchecked but lord you've defeated it you've crushed it underneath your feet and God, we are victorious because you declared your work finished on the cross. Thank you, Father, that on that cross, as Jesus hung there, he claimed victory. He wasn't defeated. He said it is finished. Thank you for setting us free. And Father, it is our prayer that we would live as a people who have hope that we would not be overwhelmed with discouragement, that we would not be overwhelmed with negativity, but Lord, that we would experience the genuine hope that you have for those of us who are in Christ. Thank you, Father, for what you did for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.